We are surrounded by a pseudo Christian culture that every year makes a claim to the resurrection of Christ. It's a culture that has its roots in a subversive false religion of ordinances, pagan rituals, sacraments, cannibalism, and most dismally, a once a year commitment to an apparently powerless resurrected Christ and delayed resurrection and kingdom of God's people. 16th and 17th century Protestantism merely dropped the portions of the mass Eucharist cannibalistic rituals of the East, West, and Catholic churches, but maintained allegiance to an abrogated Mosaic Passover, all in the name of, quote, do this until the Lord comes. But the most incriminating and diabolical aspect of the supposedly orthodox Catholic and Protestant churches is their misplaced acknowledgement of a resurrection of Christ that for them has remained ineffectual, devastatingly impotent, and leaves the church of God with a pseudo kingdom filled with dead people. That is, for the vast majority of professing Christendom, they see the people of God as hoping for a future eternal life, a future glory, a future resurrection, a future king, and a future kingdom, on which no one can lay claim until their delayed hope is fulfilled, a fulfillment which could happen, according to them, at any moment, tomorrow, or thousands of years into the future, a fulfillment that leaves Christ's resurrection as an isolated miracle 2,000 years ago that is a mere historical event taking thousands of years to do what Christ set out to accomplish. Christ ascended and the angel said he would return. But when? While on the earth, Christ said, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then recompense every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Matthew 16, 27, and 28. What did the first century believers expect Christ to accomplish? After Christ had been dead for three days, the disciples said, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. Luke 24, 21. Simeon was confident. Now, Lord, you let your bondservant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. So we see that the disciples longed for him to redeem Israel. They expected that of Messiah. Simeon expected Christ to give revelation to the Gentiles and to glorify Israel. <clears throat> in fact, one will find in all the words of the prophets that when Messiah would arrive, he would bring life, resurrection, redemption, ransom, glory, his kingdom, and the presence of God. We see this prediction of life in Psalm 16, verse 11. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. And in your right hand, there are pleasures forever. We know Jesus called himself the way. In Isaiah chapter 35, he is called the way of holiness. So he is the path of life. Resurrection, ransom, and redemption all in one passage. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Hosea 13, verse 14. Glory was predicted in the prophets. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Isaiah 60, verse 1. No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor, bright, nor for brightness will the moon give you light but you will have the Lord for an everlasting light and your God for your glory. Isaiah 60, verse 19. Very similar to Simeon's expectation. 
his kingdom was prophesied. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Daniel 2, verse 44. And in chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And just a side note, this is what Jesus told Caiaphas, the high priest. After this, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power. Continuing in Daniel 7, verse 14, And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. One kingdom they expected. In Isaiah, the famous Christmas text, chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, we sing about this and we quote it. Every Christmas, as if it's fulfilled, but do we really believe it's fulfilled? For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So we would say that the son has been given and that the the child has been born to us 2,000 years ago, but then suddenly we interject a 2,000-year interim period between that first part and and the government will rest upon his shoulders. But then we go back 2,000 years and say that this part is fulfilled. He's wonderful, counselor, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. But then we shoot forward 2,000 years. There will be no end to the increase of his government or peace. It makes no sense to do that. No, Jesus came as the prophets expected and as the first century believing Jews expected on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So it was the zeal of God that would perform this. No man or group of men could thwart the hand and plan of God. There was no plan B, as dispensationalism affirms. The presence of God was predicted, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's Jeremiah 31, verse 33. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And of course, this is seen to be fulfilled in the Gospels with the birth of Christ. And I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it will be an everlasting covenant with them. The New Testament is frequently referred to as the everlasting covenant. We see that in Hebrews 13. And I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in their midst forever. Ezekiel 37, verse 26. How were these promises to be fulfilled? This is from 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20. For as many as may be the promises of God, all of these Old Testament promises, in him they are yes, and that's the key phrase, in him, in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Therefore also by him is our amen to the glory of God through us. Peter states exactly what had to happen to make these promises effectual. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. All of those promises we just read. That God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that. He raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son. Today I have begotten thee. That was the fulfillment of the resurrection. That is the begetting of the Son of God. He raised up Jesus, as it is also written, You are my son. This day have I begotten you. That is, I have raised you. 
And as for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no more to return to decay. He has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings or mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. In other words, forgiveness is associated with resurrection and the fulfillment of all of the promises that the prophets made. Verse 9, and through him everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. That's what Jesus said. Whoever commits sin is the slave of sin, but if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Paul reiterates this same message, even further clarifies that he was only preaching what Moses and the prophets said would come. Acts 26 verses 22 and 23. And so, having obtained help from God, I stand to this day, testifying to both small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. Anything that Jesus or Paul or Peter, James, John, Jude, any of the New Testament writers were only declaring what the prophets were teaching would come to pass. They did not introduce anything new in terms of the fulfillment of prophecy. It all had been said, and they were now revealing that it was fulfilled in the finished work of Christ's cross, resurrection, and presence with them. Emmanuel, God with us. And so, having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying to both small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he should be the first to proclaim light to both Jewish people and to the Gentiles. In other words, what he's saying is by reason of the resurrection of the dead or by the working of the resurrection of the dead, by the effect of the resurrection of the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light to both the Jewish people and the Gentiles. And that goes hand in hand with John chapter 14 and John 7. Jesus said to the woman at the well, you would have asked, I would have given you water springing up into everlasting life. And he clarifies exactly when that would take place. He says, he that believes on me out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this spake he of the Holy Ghost, which had not yet been given for he was not yet glorified. So Jesus rose from the dead and sent the Holy Spirit and brought his church into the kingdom. That was the fulfillment of living waters. That was the fulfillment of light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He said, you are the light of the world. Paul said that Jesus had sent him and Barnabas and the apostles to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, just like Simeon expected. The glory of Israel. The Old Testament prophets promised that life, resurrection, redemption, ransom, glory in his kingdom, and the presence of God would come through Messiah. Peter said all the promises were fulfilled by Christ's death and resurrection. Specifically, the New and Everlasting Testament declares all these to be fulfilled in Christ. Again, quote, all the promises of God in him are yes. So now we see life was fulfilled. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. There it is. That is the only life of which the prophet spoke, eternal life that is in his Son. John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. We have been raised together with him, Ephesians 2. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus spoke of himself as the bread of life. Jesus spoke of himself as the living waters. Jesus spoke of himself as the light. We say all those things are spiritual. Well, he also said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those two are spiritual in nature. 
Everyone, it says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. Speaking of Old Testament believers, there's your resurrection. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? There is the life. And we are joined having the same promises fulfilled to us as Old Testament resurrected believers, which is why Hebrews says, you have come to the spirits of just men made perfect. And that quote there is from John 11, verses 25 and 26. So we see the resurrection is also fulfilled in Christ. Even so, Romans 6, verse 13, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Once again, all the promises of God in him are yes. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those, what? Alive from the dead. Another translation says, reckon yourselves to be alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Romans 6, 13. Colossians 2, verse 13. And when you were dead, there is the deadness of which we speak, the deadness of the garden the deadness of Israel under the law. And you were dead in transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. The word of God teaches that Jesus was made alive and sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heavenly places. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, 19 through 21, and Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. And the Bible says he is at the right hand in heavenly places. And he says he has made us alive together with him and seated us together with him in heavenly places. We are with Christ raised together. Fullness, resurrection, newness of life, new creation fulfilled all the promises of God in him. So he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Redemption is also fulfilled. We saw that it was predicted and now we see it's fulfilled. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. Luke 1 verse 68. Romans says we are justified as a gift by his grace. How? Through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, Romans 3, 24. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Galatians 3.13, 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but you were redeemed, is what he is implying, with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Ransom, predicted in Hosea 13, fulfilled in Galatians 3. He redeemed us from the curse of the law, he redeemed us, obviously, by the blood of Christ. And we also see that he ransomed us by his death. As Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I will ransom them from the grave. And the ransomed, Isaiah says, the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion. That's the church. The Bible says we have come to Mount Zion, Hebrews chapter 12. With everlasting joy upon their heads, they will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. And you might say to me, but I still have sorrow. Do you believe that Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant was fulfilled? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. That's Isaiah 53. And we believe that he's carried our sorrows. He's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Well, the Bible says that the inhabitants of the land shall not say, I am sick, for they shall be forgiven their iniquity. That's the sickness. Those are the sicknesses and the diseases which Psalm uh, chapter 103 associates with him removing our transgressions as far as the east is from the west. That is the sickness. With his stripes, we are what? Healed, healed from sin and death and curse. So Isaiah speaks of that ransoming, bringing God's people to Zion, shouting for joy. Glory. I hear so many believers 
So many professing believers, even preterists, saying that we're not yet glorified. But what does the word of God teach? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these also he called. We believe that to be fulfilled. He called us. And whom he called, these he justified. We believe that he's justified us. And whom he justified, these he glorified. But what? Are we saying that glorification is separated by 2,000 years? Absolutely not. We are showing from the scriptures that we are glorified. The glory of your people Israel, Isaiah 60 and Luke chapter 2 and Simeon. A question, are all of God's people one in Christ? What does this have to do with God glorifying his people? Galatians 3 is very clear. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Even Caiaphas prophesied that Christ would die not for that nation only, but he, that he might gather together in one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Ephesians says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might what? Gather all things together in Christ Jesus. How did he do it? Through his death and resurrection. So if we agree that we are one in Christ, we come to that conclusion, what do we make of this particular passage? What is necessary in order to become? We agree that we are one, but what is necessary in order to become one? I do not ask in behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may be one, even as you, Father, are in me. So Jesus prayed that they may be one, and he accomplished this high priestly performance of this. So he prays that they may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you did send me. And the glory, listen, are we glorified? And the glory which you have given me, the, that glory could not be any greater. And the glory which you have given me, I have given them so that what? They may be one. Well, Galatians says we're one. So the glory has taken place through Christ's death and resurrection. He conquered death. We have life. We have light. We have glory. We have been ransomed. We have been redeemed. John 17, 20 and 22. Jesus said, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall become one flock with one shepherd. Well, that's language reminiscent of Ezekiel chapter 37, where he says he would join the northern kingdom with the southern kingdom and make them as one. And he speaks of dry bones in that context. It's the resurrection. We have been united. They were united. And all of those who believe in Christ enter the gates of the city and become united with Zion, with the new Jerusalem, with all those alive from the dead. Well, the kingdom is fulfilled. So many have distorted and twisted the scriptures to say that there are different parts of the kingdom or a supposed already but not yet. This is hogwash. It's false. It's error. There was one kingdom which the prophets prophesied, and that kingdom has been fulfilled. The first words of John the Baptist when he began his ministry were, Now in the, those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He knew it was at hand. The Messiah was about to perform his work. What were the first words of Jesus? The first words of Jesus when he began his ministry. When he had heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now watch, this was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And to those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death. So Christ has come to bring light and life. Upon them light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He associated light and life with the kingdom of heaven. And it was at hand back then. 
Maybe they actually meant what they said. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, everyone continues to ask that today, but they were asking it back then, and Jesus answered precisely and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you, Luke 17, 20 and 21. It's within us. It's Christ in us, dwelling in us. So in the book of Acts, why do we see a sudden surge of the preaching of the kingdom by Jesus in the Gospels and the Apostles? But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. It is one of the, the callings, the greatest callings of any preacher or teacher is to preach the kingdom. It's what Jesus did. Soon after, he began going around from one city and a village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom. We preach it. It's fulfilled. We don't preach it as a delayed future. It's fulfilled in Christ. But he said to them, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Psalm 145, they shall speak of his kingdom, the glorious majesty of his kingdom. To these also he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days. What did Jesus teach during those 40 days? Speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God, Acts 1 verse 3. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike, Acts 8 12. So they preached the kingdom of God, the good news about the kingdom of God. That is the gospel of the kingdom. You can't preach the gospel without the kingdom. And he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about what? The kingdom of God, Acts 19, verse 8. Acts 20, verse 25, after he had spent three and a half years teaching the elders at Ephesus in the Ephesian church. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. If the kingdom is missing from our message, we are not preaching the gospel, the good news. Why? Because the good news is the good news of the kingdom. When they had set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers, and he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about what? The kingdom of God. He solemnly testified about the kingdom and tried to persuade them of things concerning Jesus, both from the law of Moses and the prophets from morning to, until evening. That's a long message. And it's a long message that is worthy to be long. It is the message that we must always proclaim the kingdom of God and Jesus. Acts 28, 31, he preached the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. And finally, regarding the kingdom of God, has that been fulfilled? One kingdom. He delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. King James says he has translated us. We have been translated into the kingdom. The kingdom is within you. And then last, the presence of God. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Fulfilled here in 2 Corinthians 6, 16. We are the temple of the living God, just as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk among them. We are with God now. Revelation chapter 21. I will be their God. They shall be my people. That's what Revelation 21 says. And it's a fulfillment of Jeremiah 31 through 33. God promising that he would dwell with us how? Through the new covenant. Jesus said, it's the new covenant in my blood, consummated through his resurrection. For by one offering, he is perfected for all time those who are sanctified. We are totally perfected. And the Holy Spirit bears witness to us for after, saying, this is the covenant. It's the new covenant. I will make after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart, make a reference, cross-reference to Romans chapter 8, and upon their mind I will write them. It says he fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law for us. That's how it is seen as written on our hearts. It's fulfilled through the work of Christ. 
and their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. In other words, it was through his flesh that brought, it was his flesh and sacrifice that brought us through the veil into the holiest of all. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clear, clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. It's the water of Christ. It's the living waters of the gospel. We are washed. Our conscience is pure. We have been perfected. We have been made holy, teleos, completed. We are a new creation. We are risen with Christ, raised up with him in fullness, totally glorified. So I hope you're having a wonderful Easter. This message is brought to you for Easter, April 1st, 2017. And I hope you were blessed by this and enjoy being glorified. Thank you.